Warning. This video was recorded on the morning of Newcastle's game against Burnley last weekend, when they very rudely ruined my introduction by winning their first game of the season. So yes, you won Eddie. Enjoy the three points, I hope it makes you very happy. Dear Lord, what a sad little life. I just thought I'd warn you of that fact before the actual video begins, but thankfully, the rest of it remains unchanged and just as relevant following Eddie Howe's first victory at St. James's Park. Okay, here we go. Newcastle United remain, at the time of recording, the only team in the entire English Football League pyramid not to have won a league game this season. To state the obvious, 14 games and 4 months into the current Premier League campaign, that is pretty concerning. It means that Newcastle are rooted to the foot of the Premier League table, with just 7 points to their name, and the most goals conceded of any team in the division. It would be fair to say then that it has been a fairly unusual first half of the season for Newcastle fans, almost all of whom were overjoyed to finally see the back of Mike Ashley, some of whom felt a little uneasy about the nature of the regime that replaced him, and going through all of those off-field emotions whilst, on the pitch, the team's struggles have continued under both regimes and indeed under the stewardship of both Steve Bruce and Eddie Howe, the latter of whom certainly hasn't enjoyed any kind of honeymoon period or new manager bounce, as we have seen at other Premier League teams who have experienced a change of manager this season. The saving grace for Newcastle fans, seemingly ever since October 7th, has been the fact that the club now has very deep pockets. And, ironically enough, thanks to Mike Ashley's frugality, they also have the freedom to put a lot of that cash to work. Therefore, the January transfer window has long been held up as Newcastle's lifeline this season, a golden opportunity for them to go out and make a real statement of intent, greatly improve the quality of the players at the club, and for Eddie Howe to really put his stamp on this Magpies squad. At the beginning of November, I had several conversations with friends, and even one or two strangers or acquaintances at parties, football matches, or on nights out, who stated very confidently that Newcastle would be fine once the transfer window came around. It was an understandable opinion, probably premised on the idea that the club would win at least a couple of games before 2021 came to an end but I must admit, I wasn't entirely convinced. Three or four games on, I am even less convinced, and I get the impression that doubt is starting to creep in for a lot of other people as well, both Newcastle and non-Newcastle fans alike. So in today's video, I wanted to talk a little bit, or a lot, about what seems to be a fairly under-acknowledged and under-discussed dilemma perhaps even a crisis, that Newcastle United are facing heading into the January transfer window. A dilemma of transfer strategy, budgeting, senior management, and how to deal with the very real threat of relegation from the Premier League, along with my best suggestions on how to solve it. One of the key issues that Newcastle United will face in January, regardless of who calls the shots and where they look to strengthen, is the calibre of player that they're able to attract to St. James's Park. Much has been made of the attractiveness of Newcastle upon Tyne as a city, or its lack thereof, a little too much I think. Whilst it is certainly true that some players want to be down south and closer to London, and we have seen that trend continue to play out in recent years, and that Manchester is widely viewed as being the next best thing, so to speak, Newcastle has as much to offer as just about anywhere else. And only if, or when Newcastle, start looking to attract truly elite level players on astronomical wages, do I envisage that becoming an issue. What is an issue, however, is Newcastle's standing as a football club. Being based in London might help Crystal Palace when trying to sign players, but the reason they can sign much better players now than they could 10 years ago, despite not having moved over the past decade, is because they are an established Premier League team rather than one embroiled in a championship relegation scrap. The reality for Newcastle United this winter is that they are a team with a high probability of playing championship football next season a manager with a good domestic reputation, but who is by no means a star likely to be able to attract blockbuster signings all on his own, and, particularly for attacking players, they are not likely to be a team that is dominating possession and creating a hatful of chances every week. In terms of some of the bigger name players that Newcastle have been linked with, that could be an awfully tough sell. 
even if the club is willing to pay over the odds in terms of wages, which presents issues all of its own. I'll come back to some of them, but in a purely player capacity, if you start offering exorbitant wages to twist the arms of reluctant players to sign for you, one, you end up with players whose willingness to play for the club is questionable at best, Two, you run the risk of irritating existing players, especially if they outperform those new arrivals because they earn less. And three, you start a sometimes endless cycle of wage inflation, which starts with existing players demanding parity with new arrivals who they consider to be their equals or at least to have their salaries adjusted in line with them and continues with every new signing you make, since those things are not very well-kept secrets in football. On the subject of finances, much has been made of Newcastle's supposed £200 million transfer budget, which has been repeated by a number of newspapers and websites. Though, it's important to note how that figure was arrived at. I don't want to get too bogged down in accounting because I know some people switch off when I do that, but essentially, the Premier League's profitability and sustainability rules dictate how much money a club is allowed to lose over a three-year period, a calculation that has become a bit messier and more confusing in recent years due to COVID impact assessments. The long and short of it is that Newcastle, based upon their current revenue figures, could spend a maximum of £200 million over the next three years, as per their official accounts, whilst remaining within the rules. And as far as I can tell, that is the only justification given for claims that the club is willing to spend that amount. Of course, just because £200 million is the maximum amount that Newcastle can spend within the rules does not mean that it is exactly how much they will spend, nor does it dictate when they will spend it. What's more, that number is rather misleading as a transfer budget since Newcastle's profit and loss calculations will be based on a lot more than simply outgoing transfer fees. Wages, for example, now account for a higher proportion of a team's outgoings than transfer fees. Also, the way in which football club accounting works is that when you pay, let's say, £50 million for a player and they sign a five-year contract, your accounts will show that as being a £10 million outgoing each year for five years rather than a one-off payment of £50 million due to what is called player amortisation. That means that Particularly if they signed players on long-term contracts, Newcastle could actually spend a great deal more than £200 million. Throw in the fact that that £200 million figure quoted is based upon Newcastle's existing revenue, which is liable to change based upon what division they're playing in, an increase in commercial revenue through fans buying merchandise, and so on and so forth, and you start to realise that the often quoted £200 million is virtually meaningless. The Telegraph reported in October that a source at Newcastle had told them that the club's January transfer budget would actually be £50 million, though they didn't name any source and, given the fact that Newcastle haven't won a game since then, you suspect that even if that were true at the time, it might not be now. Whatever the exact figure, which, as I say, is dependent upon multiple factors and unknowns, it is certainly capped and not limitless. And if you're not careful, you end up in a situation like Everton, where your owner has a huge amount of money, but is unable to spend it, or even worse, you end up in a situation where you fall foul of the rules and get hit with fines, embargoes, and all the rest of it. Assuming that Newcastle don't go on a brilliant run of form in December, a month which sees them face Liverpool, Man City, and Manchester United in successive games, along with some friendlier looking fixtures, the club will enter the January transfer window with their weakest possible hand, due to their league position and general predicament. Every team in the world, and especially those in England, knows that Newcastle are rich and desperate. And having met a fair few rich and desperate people in my lifetime, I can tell you that what often happens to them is that they get taken for a ride. By everyone. Just take a look at Tottenham's summer transfer window following the sale of Gareth Bale for over £85 million. Aside from Christian Eriksen, virtually every one of their summer signings proved to be a very costly dud, whether that be £30 million for Eric Lamella, £26 million for Roberto Soldado, or £17 million for Paulinho. To use an example that is even closer to home for Newcastle fans, they were able to profit very nicely from Liverpool's desperation and deep pockets following the £50 million sale of Fernando Torres, 
somehow managing to get them to cough up £35 million for Andy Carroll. We see these scenarios play out all of the time. It was the same following both Chelsea and Manchester City's billionaire takeovers, which are comparisons that I will return to in just a moment's time. So Newcastle can either spend a fortune this January when they are unlikely to attract players who will take them to where they want to be long-term and will have to pay a fortune for the privilege, particularly mid-season, which always carries a premium, or they can keep their powder dry, make more modest and precise additions, sending out a message that Newcastle aren't going to be taken for mugs, whilst also holding back cash, which can then be put to work when the club has a slightly stronger negotiating hand with both players and clubs, and is able to attract a higher calibre of player. The counter-argument to that, of course, is that if Newcastle don't go big this January, looking at the situation they are in right now, they run the extremely high risk of getting relegated. The counter to that counter-argument, if that makes sense, which I have seen made, is that Newcastle should just accept relegation, not in the sense of being resigned to that fate, but simply acknowledging that it is a distinct possibility and that perhaps in the long term, even going down would be preferable to splashing their cash in January, which would carry no guarantee of survival in of itself, of course, and then having your hands tied behind your back for the next three or four years. I don't think that the club will go down that route, simply because relegation would be seen as a PR disaster and as a humiliation for both Amanda Staveley and particularly for the Saudis. Following all of that early takeover excitement where expectations were set sky high with talk of a major trophy within the next five years. I have seen some talk of the impact that relegation might have in terms of Newcastle fans turning on their new regime, but I think they are rather overblown. Whilst it might undermine some of that early optimism, I don't think anyone expected a revelation overnight, and I suspect most would be reasonably patient and understanding. Though, perhaps, if there wasn't significant investment in January, and then the club was relegated, no doubt some would be concerned at the seeming disparity between what had been promised and what the new ownership had done at its earliest possible opportunity to prove their commitment. Also, relegation comes with its own pretty major impact to the club's revenue, which itself would hamper Newcastle's ability to invest heavily in the future. There is certainly an image problem with relegation, under the circumstances, in as much as the club would very visibly appear from the outside to have gone backwards, and would literally have done so, in terms of their standing of course. It would mean a huge reassessment of the new owner's timeline for success, and playing championship football obviously results in a big shift in terms of the calibre of player that you are able to attract to the club. It's also just not great optics. The fact that Newcastle enjoyed such vast support and huge waiting lists for season tickets upon a takeover promising bold ambitions, if all of those packed houses are then crammed into St. James's Park for second tier football for the third time in 12 years, to watch their team take on the likes of Peterborough, Luton and, who knows, maybe even Sunderland. On the flip side, along with the obvious benefits of keeping cash on the sidelines and sending out a message that you won't pay a 20 to 30% premium for anyone that you want to sign if Newcastle were to be relegated, it also gives Eddie Howe the opportunity to have a proper clear out of that squad, evaluate it fully, and possibly even blood some talented young players who might not have got much of a look in in the Premier League. What's more, whilst it obviously isn't where either of them want to be, both Newcastle and Eddie Howe are promotion specialists. Following both of their last two relegations from the Premier League, Newcastle cruised to the championship title in the first season. Meanwhile, Howe won three promotions at Bournemouth, including the club's first ever promotion to the Premier League, also as champions. When you talk to a lot of people about Newcastle's predicament, at least when the takeover went through, they drew parallels with both Chelsea and Manchester City's takeovers at the hands of Roman Abramovich and Sheikh Mansour in 2003 and 2008 respectively. Of course, the comparisons are entirely legitimate in the sense that all three were teams with enormous potential and they were taken over by people, companies or regimes with unprecedented wealth in the history of the division. That much is certainly true. However, it is worth noting that there are also some grave differences. Neither Chelsea nor Manchester City were in relegation scraps when they entered their first transfer window under their new owners. 
Chelsea had finished fourth the season before Roman Abramovich arrived and were therefore competing in the Champions League during his debut campaign, where they even reached the semi-finals. That is a far cry from going 14 games without winning a single game in the Premier League. Manchester City were coming from a lower base, though they had finished ninth the previous season, 19 points above the bottom three, and they were managed by the former England boss. Even in the case of Man City, who were far better placed in 2008 than Newcastle are now, they still had trouble attracting the truly elite level players from the word go. Robinho might have been their immediate marquee signing for a British record transfer fee, but even his standing had been greatly reduced by that point compared to just a few years earlier. And people are quick to forget about the likes of Wayne Bridge, Craig Bellamy, Gareth Barry, Julian Lescott, and Roque Santa Cruz, talented players who played varying roles of importance in the club's rise before the likes of David Silva, Yaya Torre, and Sergio Aguero came in and really took the team onto the next level. In terms of the players that Newcastle have been linked with, most heavily at this stage, some of the names that I've seen include James Tarkovsky, Jesse Lingard, and Dusan Blahavich, and I think it is worth taking a little look at all three. Tarkovsky, subscribers to this channel will know, I think is a very good centre-back. However, he is also 28 years old, he is out of contract at the end of the season, yet Burnley have reportedly stuck a £35 million valuation on his head. Given the previous two qualifiers, that is a valuation which basically says not for sale, which is a risky strategy on Burnley's part, but also a somewhat understandable one given Tarkovsky's importance to them, along with the fact that they will view Newcastle as relegation rivals. What's more, it has been reported that Tarkovsky is quite content to see out the season at Burnley, with his preference being a move to West Ham on a free transfer with a fat sign-on bonus in the summer. At this moment in time, you can see how that would be a more attractive proposition than joining winless Newcastle mid-season in a relegation scrap. Meanwhile, the Hammers have aspirations of going far in the Europa League and of qualifying for the Champions League this season. Jesse Lingard was West Ham's star man in many respects during the second half of last season. You would imagine that the Hammers would still be interested in signing him and he retains ambitions of representing England on the international stage. With all of that in mind, is he really going to drop down to the bottom place side and risk relegation? Vlahovic would be an absolutely stunning signing, equivalent to Chelsea signing Crespo or Man City signing Robinho early in their billionaire ownership regimes. But I honestly cannot see it happening. Almost any team in Europe would take the big sub, and on current form, I'd say he's more likely to be playing in the white of Real Madrid than the white of Newcastle United next season. If, and it is an absolutely enormous if, Newcastle were able to sign him, he would set them back £70 million, which is his release clause, which is over a third of Newcastle's alleged, but almost certainly inaccurate, £200 million three-year transfer budget, and it's £20 million more than the Telegraph claimed that they were willing to spend in this window in total, but going towards the signing of a single player. You're then talking about a 21-year-old who has never played in the Premier League before, basically being tasked with scoring the 10 to maybe even 15 goals in just half a season that would likely be required to keep Newcastle in the Premier League. I think Vlahovic is a fantastic prospect, but that is a heck of a big task for anyone. Of course, those are just three examples, and three of the most prominent that I have seen reported but they are a worthwhile reminder of the realities of the transfer market and how difficult it will be for Newcastle. £200 million, whether it is accurate or not, and let's face it, it's almost certainly not, might sound like a lot of money, and obviously it is. But as we have established, it is a false figure to begin with, and even if Newcastle were to decide to spunk it all at once in a desperate survival bid, it is an amount of money that is incredibly easy to waste within the modern game. Just ask Fulham who spent over £100 million in the summer of 2018, only to finish 19th the following season, 10 points off survival. I think it would be fair to say that I've brought up a rather lengthy list of problems, or quandaries at least, that Newcastle are going to have to wrestle with over the next couple of months, without offering up all that many solutions. That is partly to do with the nature of this video, and its title, which is addressing the dilemmas facing the club, but if the Newcastle hierarchy were to approach me for advice, which, 
I should think is unlikely given the videos that I've made about them in the past, along with their infamous disdain for journalists, but, you know, just imagining that they did, purely hypothetically, what would I suggest? Personally, I would advise extreme caution. And I know that sounds very vague and wishy-washy, so I will elaborate on what I mean. Newcastle don't currently have a director of football, and are considering delaying appointing one until after the January transfer window, according to The Athletic. Lee Charnley has also been let go as managing director, following 22 years at the club, with his successor not yet having been appointed and, no one rumoured, to have been lined up. Steve Nixon, who has been Newcastle's head of recruitment since July 2017 and was famously furloughed by Mike Ashley at the start of the pandemic, still retains that role and job title and is therefore expected to be Newcastle's transfer czar in the January transfer window, working in tandem with Amanda Staveley and Eddie Howe. This all gives the impression that the club is rather rudderless, particularly in terms of their recruitment policy and Nixon is someone who has never been a head of recruitment or chief scout anywhere else. Prior to becoming Newcastle's head of recruitment, he spent over 10 years as the club's head of youth recruitment, and before that, he spent a further 10 years as head of academy recruitment at Blackburn Rovers. I am not going to pass any judgement on his talents, how could I, but what we do know is that Nixon is someone with no previous experience of working with a budget like the one Newcastle are expected to have this January, and in their coming transfer windows. And from the outside looking in, it is unclear whether the new regime sees him as an integral part of their plans going forward, or whether they just haven't decided who to replace him with yet, and don't want to sack everyone whilst having no replacements lined up. There is a real danger of a lack of joined up thinking at the club, and that if things don't go well, you could potentially end up with a new director of football finally being appointed after the January transfer window, who doesn't even like the players that you have just signed, potentially, at great cost, on big long-term contracts, or, at the very least, that he doesn't feel they fit into what he wants to do at the club and his long-term plans. Or her plans, I should say, of course. That is unless Newcastle plays all of their trust in Eddie Howe, making him an old-school manager rather than just a head coach, with vast control over the running of the club and their recruitment which almost no one does these days, and which would seem extremely unlikely to me, and I do mean almost unfathomable. So returning to my advice, I would start by emphasising the importance of loan deals to Newcastle in January. The Magpies currently only have Santiago Munez on loan, and since he isn't registered to play in the Premier League, they still retain the maximum allowance of two loan players that they will be able to go out and sign next month, both of which must be used wisely. Just look at the impact that Conor Gallagher is having at Crystal Palace right now, and there have been several Premier League teams who have owed their survival, in no small part, to loan players. Loan deals will reduce the financial burden on the club, compared to signing a player permanently, in terms of their favourability when it comes to long-term FFP implications. The player, then, doesn't have to worry about ending up in the Championship next season because they would only be at Newcastle until the end of this season, while still having the incentive of keeping the club in the Premier League and a possible permanent transfer to a then-ambitious Premier League club heading into a fresh season. And if the new director of football, appointed after January, doesn't like them, they're not lumbered with them for the next three to five years, just for a few months where survival is all that matters and then they can start to execute their long-term vision. Sorry, sorry, I probably shouldn't use the word execute in relation to anyone who is working for the Saudi state. But yes, loan deals are a win-win-win-win, so to speak, and they might just prove to be the single most crucial aspect of Newcastle's January transfer business. The likes of Jesse Lingard or Donny van der Beek almost certainly aren't going to join Newcastle United on a permanent basis this winter, I would imagine but it might just be possible to convince them of a loan move. Next up on Alfie's unwanted list of suggestions would be to take a look at the cream of the crop in the championship. Just as West Ham have done with Saeed Ben Rama and Jared Bowen, and Crystal Palace have done with Eber Echieze and Michael Alise. These are all young, hungry, talented players who don't command that Premier League premium, are capable of performing in the Premier League, and even if you do still go down, you know that they are perfectly placed to rip up the championship and carry you straight back up again. It is 
extremely difficult to sign players from championship teams with promotion ambitions mid-season, simply because promotion is always going to be worth more to them than any single player sale. But the likes of John Swift at Reading, who are down in 21st place and have some serious financial problems, Jed Wallace at Millwall, or Joe Worrell at Nottingham Forest, could prove to be gettable, among many others of course. My last piece of advice, which doesn't just go for Newcastle, would be to turn their attention to the bottom half of the league and table. French football often proved to be a happy hunting ground for Newcastle, even during the largely miserable Mike Ashley era, and there has never been a better time to pick off the better players from the lesser clubs in the top flight of French football than right now. The league is in financial disarray, and those unable to weather the storm of a loss of TV money will have to sell players. What's more, for all of its critics, Lee Gunn is arguably the finest talent factory of any league in Europe. And believe me when I say that there are some real gems in there who will be available for bargain prices. The likes of Roman Favre at Brest and Mohamed Bayo at Claremont Foot have huge potential and would be available for a fraction of the price that players of similar talent and ages would command in the Premier League. I will end by saying that whilst, on the pitch at least, things may appear to be bleak at Newcastle, and they are, there are still one or two reasons to be cheerful. Above all else, they are fighting relegation from the Premier League. I know that might not seem like a positive at face value, but that means that if you can click into gear, cut out these silly mistakes, become a bit more resilient and string together a few results, things can start to look very different very quickly. Despite not winning a game all season, again, at the time of this recording, Newcastle are only six points behind Watford, who sit one place above the relegation zone. Two or three wins in a month can change everything, and ten wins will keep you up. Of course, that is almost half of Newcastle's remaining games this season, but hey, it sounded promising when I said just six points off Watford, didn't it? That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as of watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure you're subscribed, whether you are a Newcastle fan or not, to hitc 7s You can also find me on Twitter or Instagram, or, you know, both, via the username at hitc 7s on both, should that sound like something that you might want to do.